how does FPV compare to actually flying? Like with a paramotor, right off the bat, both are absolutely awesome. With paramotors, you actually get to get up there in the air and you can fly around for hours. But there's unquestionably a lot of risk involved when you separate yourself from the earth. 150 days ago, I crashed my paramotor and broke a ton of bones. And unsure if I would ever be able to launch a paramotor again, but desperately wanting to get back up into the air. Many of my subscribers had suggested that I get into FPV drones as a safer alternative. I've owned DJI drones like the DJI Phantom 4 and the Mavic. I really believe that those are exclusively for capturing a certain type of shot or, or inspecting buildings or search and rescue. But when it comes to wanting to do something like this for fun, I believe that those drones are in a category of their own, not the sort that leaves you feeling like you can fly. But maybe FPV drones are nothing like my past drones. Maybe flying one would give me the taste of flight that paramotors have always given me. Is it possible that in ways, it could be even better than flying a paramotor. To learn more about it, I scoured the internet and kept coming across one name, Where you're flying, Joshua Bardwell. I clicked on a video and right there in the opening, he said, when you crash, you don't go to the hospital. <laughs> it kind of felt like he was talking to me in that video. After watching the video, I sent him an email saying something along the lines of, I crashed and I went to the hospital. And as it turns out, he was one of the millions of people who ended up seeing the footage of my crash. And so then he and getfpv.com, the website that sells the kit that I build in this video, offered to send me out this. And that was really awesome because I was literally right about to purchase it. They didn't ask me for anything. Bardwell simply told me that he looks forward to hearing about my journey into FPV. I think that an FPV kit, not just this one is the way to go because it'll include items that will pair nicely together, taking out a lot of the guesswork, especially for beginners like myself. The kit that I received included the QAVS2 five inch carbon fiber frame made by Lumineer. By the way, five inch drones are the most common where five inch represents the diameter of the propeller. My kit also came with the Xylo Stax V2 F4 flight controller. And a flight controller is an essential component of any FPV. It's considered the brains of the quad because it processes information from the onboard gyroscope and then computes how much power to distribute to each of the motors to keep the quad stable while simultaneously handling the commands received by the radio. The flight controller tells the ESC, which is electronic speed controller, a separate circuit board position below the flight controller, the direction and the rate of speed to turn each of the propellers. My kit included the Xylostax V2 45 amp ESC. Lastly, the kit came with four of the Stealth 2207 6S 1800 kV motors. All of the hardware that was required to secure the motors, the flight controller, the ESC to the FPV drone was included in the kit, as well as the wires to link the circuit boards together, the main wire connector for the battery, the battery grip, and three sets of propellers, which was a bit of a telling sign. Basically everything was included. Aside from purchasing the highest rated soldering iron on Amazon, which was the Weller 70 watt digital soldering station and the lead solder, the brass sponge solder cleaner and a no clean flux, I picked up a few other items that were recommended by Bardwell, including a set of hex screws, a soldering mat, a device that would hold all of the components in place while I could solder them together and a smoke stopper which would prevent me from frying the circuit boards if I messed up my soldering phase of the build. Being that this was my first time soldering, I also purchased a practice board so that I wouldn't destroy the flight controller or the ESC or the radio receiver. And speaking of which, that was the only component aside from the battery and the camera system that I needed to purchase separately. The reason that that wasn't included is because there are many different types of radio frequency protocols, but currently the most popular ones are ELRS and TBS Crossfire. I went with ELRS because the controller that I purchased already came with ELRS protocol built into it. So it just made more sense. ELRS is the most popular and it's still increasing in popularity probably because it's open source with its drawback being that it can be a pain in the butt compared to other older protocols like the popular Crossfire that has been around for 
quite a bit longer. The biggest benefit would likely be that ELRS is a little bit more affordable and Crossfire is considered to be a bit more user friendly. Some people compare it to like Apple versus PC, Apple being something that is very intuitive. For the radio, I went with this Radio Master Boxer because I had received more recommendations for it than any other radio on the market. And since I had saved a few hundred bucks on the kit, I decided that I would go with the upgraded version of the Radio Master Boxer because it comes with ELRS. It has these leather grips right here, a carbon fiber finish, and most importantly, it has these higher end gimbals, which are the left and right sticks on the radio. In hindsight, I totally would have been fine with the $150 version of this radio, but I wanted to feel the power in my hands while holding this uh, Radio Master Boxer Max. And not wanting to pester him with a follow-up question to every suggestion that he had made, I read several comparisons and eventually found a table that stacked the latest DJI goggles, the DJI goggles 3, up against these DJI Integras. The two are virtually identical. They both have the same resolution, the same frame rate, and the same field of view. The goggles three, not these ones, do have a camera that allows you to see what's in front of you without needing to remove the goggles simply by double tapping the sides of the goggles. However, when a friend of mine recently came by offering to let me test out his DJI Avada 2 with the motion controller and DJI goggles three, I really wasn't impressed by the outward facing camera feature. To me, it was like looking through the lens of a DSLR camera that had a 50 millimeters zoom lens. Why DJI didn't opt for a wide angle lens is beyond me. However, the experience did put to rest the idea that I would prefer the Goggle 3 and hey, getting the Integra saved me about 150 bucks. It's important to know that there are several other brands that make FPV drone goggles, and I watched dozens of detailed videos that covered the pros and the cons of analog versus digital video systems, but every single person that I spoke to strongly suggested that I go with digital, even though some of them were still flying with an analog system. These old timers were like, yeah, man, everybody was doing it back then because it's all we had. It's too late for me, man. They just can't get off the ante. What I took away from all of the video reviews of the different types of video systems is that the DJI does come out on top. And I think that is the overall consensus. And I understand why the old timers are recommending this system to me because the Image quality is so much better where the only downside is that the latency or the time that it takes for the camera on the FPV drone to send its signal to the DJI goggles is slightly longer. Now, if you were a professional FPV drone pilot, that may actually be a benefit to you, but somebody starting out or even just a recreational drone pilot would never give a about a milliseconds difference in latency. You're not gonna be that good for a while, so you may as well have a beautiful image. Because I went with the DJI goggles, I needed the DJI O3 Air unit. It cost me $179, so it's at the upper end in terms of price, but as mentioned, it's the, at the top as far as image quality goes. The last item that I needed for the drone was the battery and a charger. For the charger, I simply went with what Joshua Bardwell once again had recommended. And by the way, I know I keep mentioning Joshua Bardwell, but he has like super in-depth videos. So I'm basically, you know, giving you the whole interpretation of watching a ton of his videos. And this is what I ended up with. And I'm very happy with it. But anyways, I digress. What sold me on the D6 Pro, aside from Bardwell's recommendation, along with many other people recommending it, was that it is capable of charging two batteries at a given time. More importantly, it's considered an intelligent battery, which is a safe battery charger. These batteries can be hazardous if not handled or stored properly. For example, overcharging a battery that has been damaged can lead to a pretty freaking crazy fire. I picked up the CNHL 1500 milliamp hour 100C4S SLIPO batteries because they had the highest rating on Amazon and several other people had recommended these. I am considering picking up several more. Having seen several build videos on YouTube, I was feeling intimidated at the task of taking all of these previously mentioned components 
and putting them all together. But it was a good kind of intimidation. And I think that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this in the first place. Bardwell's build series walks you through the entire process. And I really appreciated that he left in the moments where he was pausing for a second to consider if there was a better alternative to something that he was about to do. I think I'm gonna, yeah, loosen this. Come on. Yay, ESC lifts out of the way. Cable goes underneath. Oh yeah, see, that's great. Now that I know how to do it, it's easy. Ta-da! What I took away from watching Bardwell kind of tinker with the drone was that it's okay to play with the process. I imagine a lot of people think to themselves, I'm just gonna get the DJI Avada 2 because the build seems intimidating. And I was actually really close to purchasing the Avada 2 myself, but I'm glad that I didn't. And don't get me wrong, the Avada is very cool. So when my friend let me fly it, the drone was on the field and I pushed like one button and the drone just hovered up. I squeezed the little trigger which activated the joystick and then tilted it forward and then the drone actually began flying forward. I tilted the joystick to the right and the Avada moved to the right. The likelihood of sticking with something that was too easy rather than earn through blood, sweat and tears didn't seem like it would be nearly as rewarding. I was only missing one of the components to start the build, but I had the goggles and my radio. So per the recommendation of literally everyone who's making videos on how to get started in FPV, I downloaded Liftoff, which is the most popular and realistic FPV simulator on the market, and began practicing. And I was really excited when I confirmed my suspicion that I would totally suck at this, at least at first. It was the pursuit of constantly improving that made me fall in love with learning how to fly paramotors. I knew that no matter how long I stuck with it, there would always be something that I could improve upon or refine. The biggest downside to having this drive in something such as paramotoring is that you get to the point where you begin to accept more and more risk. Eventually, you mistime something and it could cost you your vitality, as was the case for me, or worse, it could end your life. The majority of fatal skydiving accidents happen to those with the most experience. Participants likely start out in sky sports feeling like the Grim Reaper is breathing down their back, and rightfully so, but eventually they forget and that's when he makes his claim. If there was one thing that I could say to my fellow flyers, I would ask them to never lose sight of the Reaper. I would love to fly paramotors again. And if I am so lucky, I will be mindful that it could be the last thing that I ever do. Like Bardwell said, when you crash your quadcopter, you'll pay to fix it, but you'll be fine. The final part for my FPV drone arrived late one evening. So the following morning I woke up at the ass crack of dawn and set up my cameras, loaded Bardwell's build video and began to follow along. And Everything went smoothly, thanks to the chipper narration of Bardwell playing in the background. And months before even purchasing the very first part needed for this build, I was both intrigued and intimidated at the prospect of being able to effectively solder something. But there I was, hot soldering tip in hand, leaded tin in the other, and I put the two together on top of one of the soldering pads, heated the bad boy up until the metal turned to liquid. I removed the hot iron tip, leaving behind a mirror-like mound of liquid metal that quickly cooled and hardened. By the time I was done, I just stared at the work that I had just completed. And it's like an ugly child that only a mother could love, but it was mine, my own, my precious. The soldering was the most intimidating part of the entire build, but once it was completed, I moved on to the computer programming part, which proved to be even more daunting in ways. First, there were the updates, updates to the DJI camera system, the ESC, the flight controller, the DJI goggles Integra, which unlike the other items, I actually had to hardwire this thing to my phone and then use the DJI app to update these goggles, everything else I was able to do using my computer with a cable plugged into it. And on the other end, the cable plugged into a micro USB port while running a program called Betaflight that is a free download on the computer. With the goggles and the camera system up to date, I followed the instructions to pair the two until a beautifully detailed, colorful image came beaming into my eyeballs. Programming the ESC and the flight controller was simple enough with Bardwell's instructions, but I really struggled to imagine how anybody would have ever gotten into this sport if they didn't have either a solid background in electronics or someone, such as a friend, who would walk them through the process in person. On that note, 
it's clear why somebody would purchase the ready-to-fly Avada. Once more, I don't believe that the juice is any sweeter than the juice that you squeezed yourself. Quadcopter propellers spin in opposite directions. The front and rear propellers can either spin in towards the center deck of the quad or they can spin out. It doesn't matter so long as they are going in opposite directions. If this front left propeller spins clockwise, this front right propeller will spin in the opposite direction, which will have a torque effect opposite to this one, and the two basically negate themselves. With my quad plugged into the MacBook, I open Betaflight's motor programming section, click the start button, and watch the prop spin. One of the motors spun in the wrong direction, so I click the reverse button, and then after a momentary pause, it started spinning once again in the same direction rather than reversing it. Researching the issue delayed my progress for about an hour, but I finally found out that I needed to update the firmware on the ESC, which is somehow different than the uh, update that I had initially done. With the firmware now on the latest version, I ran the motor setup again, clicked the reverse button on the non-compliant one, and that seemed to do the trick. There were a few more tasks to be done before buttoning up the quad, like setting up the OSD, in my headset, which is basically the on-screen display showing me all the information. I also needed to calibrate the gyroscope on the flight controller circuit board and changing some of the settings within my radio. But once again, this is a review of getting started in FPV rather than a tutorial on how to configure all of this. With the onboard and offboard electronics ready to go, I screwed down this top plate and slapped on the battery grip, connected the action camera mount and attached all of the propellers. I was eager to get my new creation up into the air, so I headed on over to the field that I've flown from hundreds of times, but for the first time, I wouldn't actually be going up with my craft. As I stood out there ready to launch, I felt anxious. I didn't want to crash. The last time that I had, my able body was crushed on the desert floor, ending my era of being young, but this was different. This would be my second shot, albeit a compromise, but a guilt-free one. I throttled up, and the quad gently lifted off. I soared around the park like I always had, and I could feel my heart pounding, but not from fear. Well, maybe just a little. I really felt like I was the one flying, and after about six minutes of flying around, I brought it in for a landing, and it felt so damn good to have put in all of that effort. I crashed my flying machine. <laughs> it was something that I could and likely would eventually destroy as I would inevitably feel the pressure to lean into increasing my skills, but that's okay because once again, I'm not gonna get hurt unless I fly this damn thing into the side of my head. Wouldn't put it past me. Okay, so initially the DJI Avada costs roughly the same amount as its home-built counterpart. Though with time, home-builds cost significantly less in more ways than one. Let's say you total your Avada 2, you'll pay $489 to replace it. And if you damage one of the components, assuming that it's one of the ones that you might be able to replace yourself, it'll cost significantly more than it would to replace the same part on your home build. For example, if you crack the Avada's frame, it'll cost you $80. If a part of my frame breaks, it'll cost between $10 and $12. A set of the Avada's propellers costs $9 compared to a set on mine, which costs $3. One of the Avada 2's batteries costs $129 compared to my $19 battery. Granted, you'll average 15 minutes of flight time per battery with the Avada 2 compared to my home-built seven minutes. I'm getting about seven minutes per battery. For $59 a year, DJI offers insurance that'll replace your drone for an additional $49, or in the event that your drone flies away, they'll send you a new one for $199. Hmm. The Avada 2 does have several advantages. Some people may not want to trouble themselves with what can often feel like an overly complicated process that is home-built FPV drones. From the soldering to the programming, I really enjoyed the struggle but I might not have had the patience for this prior to my crash, since my thirst for challenge was satiated by my pursuit in being a better paramotor pilot and instructor. Had I actually stopped to consider FPV at that time, there's a chance that I would have 
been more inclined to get the DJI Avada. Admittedly, having built my own, I am biased because I believe that building your own is worth the squeeze. Since that first flight, I've had dozens of other days of practicing with my drone, and as I hoped, with each new day, I felt increasingly more connected to the drone. In this sense, it was identical to my experience learning to fly a paramotor. It took a long time to become truly connected to the glider and to the motor. As experienced as I was at the time of the crash, there were and always would have been infinite opportunities to improve. That was the beauty of it. It doesn't matter what someone chooses to take up, so long as there's something that provides you with an opportunity to temporarily quench your insatiable desire to grow, go after it. You'll live longer because you're just not done with this life experience. I wanna get better with my drone right now, but it's likely that someday I'll plateau and perhaps I'll want to move on to something else, but right now, the end is nowhere in sight. Building your own FPV drone compared to purchasing something like the Avada 2 will give you so much more in the way of personal growth and time spent in the hobby. So folks, if you've made it this far into the video, I hope that you subscribe and check out some of my past videos. Thank you all very much for watching the video. I look forward to hearing from you in the comment section just below that like button. Until next time. Uh.